Who am I really? When I wake up and open my eyes, a familiar world surrounds me. The wardrobe, the windows, the seagulls' cries, everyday sights and sounds. But even more familiar is the feeling of being me, which arises almost effortlessly. We often overlook this sense of self, taking it for granted. But appearances can be deceiving. Most of us feel like our self is a constant and unified entity, the core of our unique identity. It seems like we receive endless waves of perceptions, as if the world pours into our minds through our senses. It seems like we're the ones making decisions, guiding our actions based on our thoughts and senses. But reality is different. The self isn't the perceiver. It's also a perception, a collection of related perceptions. Our experiences of self and the world are like controlled illusions, crafted by our brains to make sense of the world. These illusions aren't necessarily accurate. They're shaped by what's useful for our survival. So what's the real story behind our sense of self? It's a tale of the mind crafting its own reality, based not on truth, but on what helps us stay alive. Let's break down this idea, going back to ancient times, even to Plato's famous cave allegory. Imagine prisoners in a cave mistaking shadows for reality. Our senses, like sight and hearing, give us signals about the world. But these signals are fuzzy and indirect. They don't give a clear picture. Our eyes aren't like windows showing us the world as it is. Instead, our brains piece together our perception of the world, like a puzzle. Take a red coffee cup, for example. When I see it, what I'm really seeing is my brain's best guess of the signals from my eyes. And that red color? It's not something inherent in the cup itself. It's our brains interpreting certain wavelengths of light. Sir Isaac Newton showed us this centuries ago. The colors we see are just different wavelengths of light, which are colorless on their own. Yet, our brains turn them into a whole rainbow of colors. So, our experience of the world, whether it's color or anything else, is both less and more than what's actually out there. It's like living in a colorful bubble created by our brains. Let's understand what happens when we see colors. Our brain notices patterns in how objects reflect light and makes a guess about what color something is. So, when we see red, it's our brain's best guess about the signals from our eyes. But does this mean red exists only in our brains? Not exactly. Seeing red needs both the world and our brains, unless we're dreaming. Nothing in our brain is actually red, but the experience of redness happens when our brains interpret certain signals. Cezanne, the painter, once said color is where the brain and the universe meet. It's like a controlled hallucination. Our brain is always predicting what our senses will perceive, using the signals it gets to adjust its predictions. Perception isn't just about reading signals. It's about the brain actively constructing our experience, like a top-down fantasy connected to reality. This process of controlled hallucination happens all the time, shaping our unique inner worlds. Now, I've veered quite a bit from where we started, so let's circle back to the self, to what it feels like to be you or me. The big idea here is that feeling like a self, any self, is also like a controlled daydream, but a special kind. Instead of being about what's outside, feeling like a self is mostly about managing and controlling our bodies. Being a self is made up of many parts that usually stick together, but can split apart in disorders. There are feelings of being the same person over time, with a name and memories shaped by our lives. There are feelings of making choices, of meaning to do something or causing things to happen. There are feelings of seeing the world from our own perspective. Then there are the really deep feelings like identifying with our bodies, feeling emotions, or being alive. All these aspects of being a self are like predictions our brains make. The most basic part of being any self is the part that keeps our bodies running smoothly, keeping us alive. And when you think about this, 
lots of things start to make sense. Everything we experience is like our brain's guess, and all our experiences, whether about ourselves or the world, come from being living creatures. We experience the world and ourselves because of our living bodies. So, who are you really? Think of yourself like the color red. You're here, but maybe not exactly what you think. Now let's delve into the mind. How does all this brain stuff lead to consciousness, to what you experience every day? Well, first, let's clarify something. Consciousness is just your experience. They're one and the same. Now, back to the brain. The idea of your brain snug in your skull might seem weird, but trust me, it's better than the alternative. But let's get to the big question. How does a bunch of neurons, 86 billion of them, create your consciousness? It sounds tough because consciousness seems beyond just physical stuff, no matter how complex. This is what David Chalmers called the hard problem. It's like trying to explain how your feelings and thoughts come from a bunch of brain cells. It's a puzzle that's still keeping scientists up at night. But our approach is to break down consciousness into different parts, like what it feels like to perceive things, to feel like yourself, or to be awake versus asleep. And for each of these parts, we can explain how neural mechanisms in the brain create those experiences. In the bit of the story we've talked about today, it's all about predictive processing. The brain builds a model of what's causing signals from the world and uses that to shape our perception. As we work on and test theories like this, the big mystery of how and why neurons create consciousness might not get solved directly. Instead, it might just fade away as we understand more. Now let's talk about anesthesia the amazing ability to turn off consciousness in a snap. It's truly one of humanity's greatest inventions. But how does it work? Well, it's a puzzle that's still being pieced together. We know anesthetics affect different parts of the brain, essentially causing them to stop talking to each other as much. But there's still a lot we need to figure out about exactly how this disconnect happens and what it means for consciousness. There are many types of anesthesia out there, but when it kicks in, this is what you experience. Now, let's tackle a thought that's been bothering some folks. What if what I see as red looks totally different to you? Is there a way to know if we're all seeing reality in the same way? Well, here's the thing. What we perceive seems real to us, right? Like the redness of this coffee cup. It feels like a real property of the world. But here's the twist. Things like the cup's solidity are real whether or not you see them. But the redness? That's all in your mind. And because it's in your mind, it can be different for each of us. Maybe not drastically different, but still not exactly the same. There's this fancy argument in philosophy about the inverted spectrum. Like, is my red the same as your green? It's a mind-bending question, but I think it's a bit too out there. In reality, we probably see things similarly, but not exactly alike. Plus, language messes with our perceptions. I mean, just think about all the different shades of red or even white. And remember that dress that broke the internet. Some saw it as blue and black, others as white and gold. It's wild. So, yeah, we might argue about colors, but when it comes down to it, the real dress? Blue and black. No debate there. But what really threw everyone for a loop was that it wasn't just a matter of seeing the dress as one color or the other. We genuinely saw those blues, blacks, whites, and golds as real things in the world. It made us realize just how different our ways of seeing things can be. That got us thinking, how much diversity is out there in the way we perceive things? We're launching a study at Sussex to explore this over the next couple of years. We're used to hearing about extreme differences in perception, like in neurodiversity, where people's experiences lead to different behaviors. But I believe there's a whole lot more diversity in perception than we realize, lurking in the shadows. Now, back to the dress, I'm relieved we could finally settle that internet brawl and firmly declare it blue and black. 
Memory comes in all shapes and sizes, just like selfhood. When we talk about memory in everyday terms, we're usually referring to stuff like remembering what we had for breakfast or when we last went for a walk, things that shape our continuous identity over time. But here's the thing. Even if we lose some types of memory, our sense of self can stick around. Take Clive, for instance. His brain disease wiped out his ability to form new autobiographical memories, but he still had a sense of self, even though he felt like he was living in a never-ending present. Also, there are many other aspects of memory that likely contribute to what makes you, you or me, me. First off, there's semantic memory. It's the kind of memory where we just know things, like the capital of France or who the current president is. Sometimes it's handy, other times, not so much. But everything we store in our memory shapes our sense of self. Then there's perceptual memory. It's not like we can rewind our experiences like a video, but every experience we have changes how we see things in the future. And how we perceive things is also a big part of who we are. Now here's a fascinating question we're looking into. Think about a typical day. You're constantly taking in information, but when you remember that day, it's usually in chunks like, I did this, then that happened. So how does our brain chunk these memories from a continuous flow of data? It's quite surprising how little of a day we remember, and understanding this process could be really helpful especially for people with memory issues. We're not just logical computers. We're feeling machines. This idea is crucial for understanding life, mind, and consciousness. Our brains aren't just processing data. They're constantly working to keep our bodies alive. And this fundamental role of our brains gives rise to all kinds of perceptions, including our sense of self. So, in a way, our feelings are at the core of who we are. We're not just brains on sticks. We're feeling machines deeply connected to our physical existence. Enjoying the video? Don't forget to subscribe to our channel to stay updated with more amazing videos like this one. And while you're at it, why not check out the videos on the left and right side of the screen for more fascinating content? Thanks for watching.